If the course philosophy is indeed that the student is the center of of your goals, and so you're you're thinking less about what you will teach and more about how they will learn, then that's going to frame all, all of the decisions you make pretty much after that. And so I think that I would start um, sharing how the classrooms that I've been in work in that way by talking about um, how it begins. So uh, the way any of our class uh, discussions begin really is with students having already done some things on their own. Um, to me, I think that's probably the crux of how I see the classroom um, is that that both the student and I are both coming together with information to share and to talk about. Um, in a in a more traditional design, I think sometimes students walk into the classroom and could literally say, "What are we doing today?" Because they wouldn't know. It would be you know new, something that they would just be discovering in the moment. Whereas um, the philosophy that I that I like is that a student would come to the table knowing what we'll do that day because they're already bringing a lot of that content with them. Um, and then our, our, therefore, our role really in the classroom changes a little bit from um, pure content delivery to discussion, application of that content, clarification of that content. Um, you can kind of go, you can use the class time therefore in a really different way. Um, so I would say that, that the first way that this course design bit is changed by philosophy is by how, do a, how does a student prepare ahead of time. Um, and we can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, but so all students will come to class prepared with some content. We'll use the class time, as I just discussed, as a chance for us to uh, apply, to clarify, to discuss. Um, and then when it gets to the evaluation or assessment component of it, um, that does also take a change with the course philosophy. Uh, clearly one of the jobs of the the teacher is to, in the end, be able to say, this individual has learned this much, and therefore assessment is necessary. But I think that assessment can always serve a dual role, because any time a student has a chance to check in with themselves and be assessed on their knowledge, they also have a chance to learn. Uh, but I think that the modality of your test and how you put that together might affect it. Um, and so one of the ways that I've tried to implement more of a learning approach versus a pure assessment approach is by having students repeat their exams Again, but with groups. So for example, in, in our anatomy class that I teach, uh, students would take at you know two midterms and a final, they take their individual exam that looks you know reasonably like other people's exams with some multiple choice and short answer, and they do that on their own first. There's also a little open book part um, that would give them a chance to deal less with memorization and more on application. But after they've done that individual portion, they've turned that in, then the next part of the exam is for them to start at the beginning of the again, go through all of the same exam questions, but this time do it with a group. Um, and my goal there is that they should never walk out of an exam um, and see a grade online, but never really have a chance to look at that exam again, understand where did they have difficulties, where did they not. Uh, most students will come to me before the key is even up and tell me, oh, I know I did this well on an exam. And that's, and that's they haven't seen the answer key yet. This is purely from their discussions with other students. Um, and they'll come back to me and say, oh, I realized I didn't understand this, or I missed this concept. And so the goal is that before they actually are finished with the exam process, they already know as a self check-in, where did they go wrong? Where did they, um, or where did they miss a concept? Um, so that's that's a, a way to ensure that any exam is not just about, you know, assessing a student's knowledge from the outside, but from within, a student should understand what did they know, what did they not know. So those are just three different ways that this course philosophy and design might be a bit different than than the others. That Why would you be less likely to fracture your ulna than the radius or? the scaphoid when you fell on an outstretched arm, right? Find that head of the, of the ulna again and figure out where is it in relation to some of the other structures we've been palpating. <coughs> of one structure we just palpated that would come in contact with the ground far before the ulna would. That's right, the pisiform, right? Remember we palpated this? If we, if we do this, we can, it really sticks out on the, on the um, well, it's actually the medial side, but when I, 
pronate, it looks like it's lateral, right? So that's going to come in contact far before. And is it a broad, is it a broad bone that, when it, it, that takes a lot of impact? Does it look like if you were a gymnast and you were going to be on your hands that you'd be doing a lot of weight bearing through the ulna or a lot of weight bearing through the radius? Right, the radius, right? It's the broad ending. The student preparation piece, when they, when they come to class, uh, in, in the anatomy class that I teach, it's a human anatomy class. Um, there's two classes, actually, one in the fall, one in the winter with different topics. But there's a course philosophy and design that really carries across both classes. Um, and and the, the unique piece that the students do, uh, we give it a title called the student's external brain. Um, the, the reason for that title is that uh, a computer has an external hard drive, right? And that way it can do things that it, could, it wouldn't have been able to do without that extra memory. And so I, I use that analogy. And so the students have their external brain. They have their internal brain that hopefully is working all the time. But then they have an external brain that they're creating. And basically it's their own opportunity to uh, document their learning, create knowledge of anatomy through pictures, through words, through stories through analogies, whatever, whatever they need to learn, they create in this, in this document. And we call it their external brain. Um, I think the students call it their EB, because that's the hip way to talk about it in the class, I see. So they're teaching me. Um, so when students are working on their external brain, there's a lot of openness in terms of how they attack that project, because that has to do with them as a learner. Some people are very visual. Therefore, I would encourage and expect that their external brain has many images in it. Others find that they're really more word focused and that images don't really get them as far as they need. They need descriptors that are in a narrative. And so I encourage those students to include a lot of words in their, um, in their external brain. Um, so really I find that each student needs to, they need to know what content to put in it, but then they need to do that in whatever way works best for them. And so that's, that's a, a big cornerstone piece of the whole class. Every single class period, uh, a portion or a chapter of their external brain is due, um, and that carries them with the content of the day. And so, for example, if we're in the fall talking about musculoskeletal anatomy and we're talking about the upper extremity and the shoulder, then that day before they've come to class, they've put together uh, content related to the shoulder. And I give them outlines about what the content should be. I just try to leave it very open in terms of how they should put together the content. So there's sort of a balance between openness for students to fit um, themselves into the project um, and also direction for me to help them make sure that they're still uh, getting all the information gathered that they want to gather. Um, so a student will come in and they'll, they'll have their external brain in front of them and then at that point we can begin our application or clarification or discussion of the content of the day and I can ask them questions because they already have many of the answers ready to go. And that way we can give them a chance to find out did they collect the right information or have they, have they constructed the knowledge in such a way that the concepts they're building are accurate and making sense. So they have that chance in class to verify what they've put together and feel good about it. Um, and, and we do that through lots of interactive questions and we use clickers and other devices to kind of help students engage with that process. But fundamentally they show up with a lot of information and a lot of content knowledge already in their hands. So how does someone in a class of 180 to 240 collect homework assignments, which again are we call external brain assignments? Um, what are the mechanics of that? Um, so I'm lucky to have over the last six years built a, a teaching assistant program with Anatomy. Um, it started from nothing. <laughs> there was uh, a few students interested in becoming involved with the next year's class and so I invited them to join and slowly over time we've sort of built this uh, process where students who have finished the class know that there's an opportunity the following year to being a teaching assistant. And so that is actually a huge part of how we do this, the mechanics of how can I collect this many homework assignments. Um, but when I first started I didn't have that opportunity and so when I first started what my, I did to manage the number of students was to s randomly select which students would turn in their external brain that day. Um, because I, I, the way that I would express it to the students is uh, 
your, your job is just to be prepared, right? Whether I call your name or not is really of no great importance because you'll be here and you'll be prepared. And so, you know, one day I'll call you and the next day I won't. Um, and that, it works pretty well. I think students sometimes are disappointed when they can't turn it into you that day, but they, they worked with it just fine. Um, so I used to collect maybe 60 at a time in each day. Um, and then as, as this program of teaching assistant, undergraduate teaching assistants who, who volunteer, now they, I usually have about six of them work with me and each of them takes a small group um, of classes. So six years later from where I started doing all the grading myself, um, now I'm at a point where um, there are six folders around the classroom with the, you know, by last name. So students with A through C last names always know that their homework folders in the front. They pick up at the beginning of class and they turn in at the end of class. And so even with a really large group of students, like 240 in the fall term anatomy class, once you have a system like that in place, the students know where they're going, they know what they're doing, and it really is, is fairly seamless. Um, I have to have a good sturdy backpack to carry it all with me, but I carry it back to our department office and distribute it to the undergraduate TAs and they have it graded and brought back the next day. Um, I think an important part of that though um, is if is that we're not, and the students know this, but we're not grading them for accuracy. What we're doing is helping them to prioritize their work. I, and I've had good conversations with students about the fact that they're so glad I asked them to hand in their work because so many times they've said, you know, push comes to shove and you have a list of things to do and you need it to be a priority and by having to turn it in, it moves it to the top of the priority list. So they've encouraged me to continue the practice. Um, but also I try to make it very clear through a rubric that really we're confirming that they've completed the assignment and that they followed the appropriate guidelines for the assignment. And so the whole external brain assignment for the term has one set of guidelines and as long as they always follow those, and they have mostly to do with plagiarism, as long as they follow those then they will receive the check for um, following the guidelines and a, and a check for completing the assignment. So I'm not actually asking undergraduate TAs to assess whether or not the content is true or not true. Um, and I think the reason that that system still works is that the class time is meant for the student to discover whether the knowledge they've collected is accurate or not accurate. Um, if they just did the assignment and we never spoke about it again, I could see them being concerned about, well, how do I know if, if this was, if I was correct or if I was along the right lines. But because we use the class time then to go over all of that material, but in a more application fashion or in, in a, using clicker questions or some way for them to assess their knowledge, they can decide for themselves basically whether they were accurate or not accurate in their collection and, and construction of knowledge. Um, so that's part of the mechanics of how how this all happens, but um, it's it's surprisingly fluid, and uh, and again, students have the system of where to drop off and where to pick up, and the times that are appropriate to do it. And uh, and the undergraduate TAs have been have allowed me to now collect homework from every single student, every single class, and I do that every single class of of the term. Um, and it actually is with their help has become little to no burden really at all. Um, I have one. One other, other one very um, responsible undergraduate TA or sometimes a graduate student who's assigned to the class to actually do the um, uploading to Blackboard part of it. But even that, we try to keep it simple. We use a deductive system, meaning that you only need to change something in Blackboard if they didn't do what you expected, because clearly we expect all students to come and be prepared and ready to go. And so it's always, it's just a surprise if it's not. If that's the case, then we can um, move in a deductive way. That's therefore they don't have to be actually adding a grade to 240 students records it's simply the small number of students who weren't able to meet all the expectations that day they just go into their grade books and make those changes so it's actually not even too much of a time constraint even for the for that one TA or graduate student who's um, sort of leading the team um, and and to be honest the I've debated a lot about the amount of points that should be associated with something like homework and I've usually ended up in the 15 to 20 percentage points across a whole term to be associated with this and I think that students put a lot of work into it and therefore it it needs to be it needs to show I think in their overall evaluation that they have put a lot of work into it so I don't want to diminish it by making a very small amount but I felt like 20 percent with the other um, exams that they have therefore really almost nothing in the class is worth more than maybe 35 um, percent most are between 20 and 25 so it helps to distribute the different opportunities students can have to demonstrate their knowledge.
this external brain document that they're writing, and, and I, I actually refer to it to them often as, as the book they're writing, because that's really what it seems like. And, and, and the, the great part is that you all get emails back from students who have moved on and since gone on to um, medical school or to physical therapy school or nursing school, and they'll actually tell me that they still have their external brain and they still use it. And of course, you know, to any teacher, that's probably just about the best compliment you could ever hear that this authentic piece of work that they're creating is truly useful, not just in your class, but throughout. So that, that is, I try to share that with the students so they understand the long-term goal that, because many of them in the class will identify as saying that they're looking to go to grad school in a healthcare profession that would indeed rehash anatomy. So, um, so that part is a nice goal for the long term, and I think that helps them to really be thinking about, wow, it's not just about today's homework that I need to turn in, but you know, is this what I want to have with me as my book when I'm done um, and I've moved on to my chosen field? Um, but in the classroom, there's also another impetus to create a, a cohesive and easily accessible document, and that's that they use it during their exams. So uh, in the exam process that I um, use, we have three different three different parts of the exam in class when the students are working individually and then they go on to work in a group. But in that individual portion, um, part of it is a closed book part, um, multiple choice. Part of it is a closed book with some short answers. And then there's an open book section. Um, and actually the closed and open book sections are 50-50 are of the time because there's only 10 open book questions but they're case studies. So there's a long-winded case that explains a real person in a real situation and, um, and then the, the goal of that question is for them to apply their anatomy. And the, the reason I've explained to students that I want them to have that opportunity is that I know they're not going to have the anatomy that is in the forefront of their mind, as in it's sort of memorized. They're not going to carry that with them forever. But their application of the concepts, they could carry with them for a, quite a long time, as long as they know how to access those details. And so the focus of the open book part is to use the external brain they've created um, so they can just leave memorization aside and just allow themselves to practice applying knowledge to concepts. Um, and so they will, depending on how well they've put together their external brain, will facilitate how fast they can actually find the information or the details they need and then move on to the question to make sure that they're applying those details appropriately. So, um, so it does have not only the long-term goal of this being a book that they can refer back to when they move on to a graduate school um, or some sort of professional school, as many of them want to, but it also has an immediate purpose in that they will use their external brain and only their external brain to answer those open book questions. And so the, the way that they've put that together and the thoughtfulness and the design that they put into it is important for themselves in the moment too. So the first day of class, um, I have a few goals in mind uh, with the students. I think the first one uh, is to make very clear what our core, course goals are, okay? And, and the, the way that I like to talk about those are in terms of our learning objectives. And I actually feel like each class really has two sets of learning objectives. It has one set that's really content-based. So, you know, what, is, what are the content areas that you're planning to learn? Um, but the other side, I kind of think of them more as the as the learning goals or the, the things that are happening underneath the surface that are, in my opinion, just as important but often just not articulated. So for example, do we want our students to become good at understanding how they learn? You know, if that's an important part, I want to make sure I artic articulate that to, to our students. Um, uh, included in that would be uh, being able to access knowledge and construct it on their own. So I have some very specific to anatomy learning objectives and then I have some um, more broad-based, hopefully will help them wherever and whatever they're trying to learn regardless of content, but our explicit goals of the class. So we spend some time identifying each of those and, and talking them through and making sure that it's clear to them what those goals are. Um, and then we actually dive in a little bit on one of the one of the non-content-based learning objectives, which is for them to really understand their learning style. Um, I, I find that even though this is a 300 level class and students have been in many classes obviously all their lives previous to this that many of them still aren't they haven't really thought out loud about what their learning style is and how that might be different than others 
and how they should use their strengths and access it during the class. And so we do, we talk a little bit about um, this, this uh, paradigm called true colors, and really it's a paradigm that can be used in almost any setting, but in this particular case applied to education, it's really about understanding um, you know, where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses, what stresses you out as a student, and what makes you very comfortable. And we basically put out there on the table in a very transparent way that that they may be different than their peers sitting beside them, and they may be different than me. And that my way is not the only way, and I want to be really clear with them about that. But I have to, but I recognize my limitations perhaps, or I like to think of them more as not limitations, but I understand the context of which I kind of see the world, but they might see it differently. And so it's an, a chance to invite them to tell me when we're not, we're not meeting eye to eye. So it's a chance for them to come to me and say, I know you're not a detail-oriented person. I am, though, so can you help me get started with this external brain project? And actually, that's the reason we usually talk about it, because the external brain project that they'll be working on the rest of the term tends to be much more open than they're used to. I think they're used to more often than not being given very explicit expectations about don't just get this content collected, but do it this way, precisely with this included. And I like to make sure they're doing it in the style that works for them best. And that's confusing for students up front. So we have to t spend some time talking about how, you know, why would I design it that way? Why does that even fit nicely with my personality, but might be uncomfortable for them? And therefore, just give, it gives everyone a nice language, a neutral language, for people to come and say, hey, I'm gold, which is a color in this true color scheme, and I know you're not gold, Susan, so I just wanted to let you know I am, I'm feeling stressed, I'd really like to do well, and I'm not sure where to start because it's so open, this assignment, that I don't even know the first step. Can you give me a first step? And I say, sure, here's a first step for you. Try this, what do you think about this? And so it just gives us a nice neutral language. Um, so, so I guess if I think about my you know, big picture, what are my goals on the first day of class, it's to make sure they understand what the learning objectives are, understand the content ones, understand the more you know, running underneath the surface all the time objectives about learning, uh, make sure they understand who I am as a person, and make sure they're clear that I get that they're not the same as me, and that we're all unique, and that they're bringing to the table what is best for them and their own learning style, and that the goal is for them to identify it, understand it, and use it to its greatest potential, and then know when it's okay to come and say, okay, now I need help, because I'm, I'm coming up against a barrier that's too difficult for me to climb on my own, now we need to work as a team to do it. And so I try to become very personal about who I am and who they are and our, our unique you know, quirks and our differences and how we then can work together to make sure this is the best learning experience for them. Something I feel is very important, although I recognize difficult, uh, is to learn the names of the students in the class. And I think uh, at first to say, how could you possibly learn names when there's 240 people in the classroom? And actually in, in my classroom is also six to 20 students in Bend on a little TV screen. But you know, so that's just the dynamic of the classroom that I work in. And, uh, and so clearly by the end of the term, I have not learned every student's name. So that's, I, I understand that that may not be a reasonable expectation. So all I do is try to take every opportunity that I have to learn a student's name to do so. Um, for example, after class, I, I always have a number of students that stay to ask a question. And so on the first day of class, the very first people who stay and ask a question, I ask their name every single time they ask a question. Um, I'm actually a, a visual learner, and so if someone just says their name and I can't, and haven't worked out the symbols yet, I'm not gonna remember it, and I know that. And so I write it down. So I have my book in front of me, and when they come over and say, hi, you know, can I ask you this question? I answer their question and say, by the way, what's your name? And then I jot it down in my book, and just writing it for me helps to just reinforce. Um, so I'll maybe talk to five students after class the first day and get five names. And then on my way back to my office, I go through their faces and those names in my head and try to just solidify what were those people's names that I had just met. And then the first time people come to office hours, I get five more people's names and write them down and I just keep doing that. And then I make a little game for myself when I go to class. As I'm getting started, I just look around the room and start saying the people's names in my head that I, that I have. 
and I'm also the kind of learner where if I don't use it, I lose it. And so as soon as I have an opportunity to say that person's name again, I'll do it, even if I'm not sure. I just give it a try and say, is it Julia? You know, and if they say no, then I get to learn again that it wasn't Julia, it's something else, and I try to refresh it. But you know, usually four to five times I'm right, and then that name is reinforced for me. So I find that just going through that and being really open with the students saying, I want to learn your name, so I'm going to try my best, and I'm going to make some mistakes, so forgive me when I make a mistake and just tell me your name again and I'll get it eventually. And so usually by, um, usually by the end of the term, I, most students that have spoken to me, I know their name by then. Now there will always be a group of students, because there's 250 people in the class basically, that can choose to not speak to me and therefore I may have never had a chance to learn their name. But any student that has talked to me and who I have had a chance to ask, I'll ask and I'll do my best to remember. And I find that as soon as students recognize that when they ask a question and I've learned their name that I'll use it, that those students tend to ask questions more. And so I've noticed over time that it really, it does seem to matter for a number of ways. One is that students will say to me after, wow, I can't believe you like know these people's names. And so you can tell they're noticing, something's different here, right? So they, I think their assumption is, this person must be mildly invested in what we're doing because they're taking the time to learn some names. And then I've also found that the more times I make an attempt for someone's name, again, like I said, that person will ask more questions and become more involved in the class. So um, the only unfortunate group that I tend not to be able to reach with this are the ones who choose to never speak to me. <laughs> and of course, I always feel like that's my loss because I'm uh, that's my goal is to actually have a chance to build a relationship with each of them. And, and I just recognize that it, at this point, I haven't come up with a technique by which I can always reach out to each of them individually, but as soon as they take even a half step forward, then I have, I have my chance to, to get to know them. And, and it's been a really positive, uh, really positive dynamic for me in, in a large class like this. Um, I find people come to office hours a lot more um, than when I first started teaching, when I didn't have a technique to figure it out on how to start to learn names. Um, and I find more of them um, will use my name even. You know, I'm really clear that I, I like being called Susan and that Dr. Verschur is not a necessity in the class and I say Susan when I'm referring to myself in emails and, and whatnot and then I find students again, they take that little half step towards you know, making sure that they've done their part in establishing some sort of relationship for learning and, and then I have the chance to do the same. So I've, I've found that to be not really a time consuming activity, just something that takes a little bit of diligence of pulling out a piece of paper and actually writing down people's names and has a huge bang for its buck. Classroom management issues with a large class size, and I have witnessed, um, and admittedly I feel lucky not very often in a class that I've been um, instructing, but I have witnessed the, you know, surfing on the computer and the texting. I actually sat in a colleague's class of 100 level students. That was a very large class, and I did note I was almost amazed at the ability to multitask that, that the students around me seem to be able to do because I simply don't have that trait. And so I recognize that this kind of thing happens in a larger class. Um, and, I, and I think that it's, I haven't seen it happening very often in the anatomy class that I've been teaching, this large 180 to 250, depending on the, the term, um, class. And, and I think it's because of the, the style of the class. Um, so if the classroom is the t a passive classroom environment in that the instructor is delivering and the student's job is to passively take in information, then really any given student may indeed be able to do two things at once, right? Depending on their um, level of ability to multitask or the, you know how much information they're interested in, in bringing in at one time. And I, I think that that's part of that dynamic. You're giving... When a student has, is sitting and passively taking in, they have a lot of choices about what to do with their time in that moment. Um, and so I think that the dynamic, the way the dynamic is different in the anatomy classes that I've been teaching is that they're very interactive. So students sit in groups. They sit in groups from basically week two of the term onwards. Um, and they are constantly being asked questions throughout the class. So um, we might, 
you know, take a topic that, again, they've already prepared, they've brought that information with them to the classroom, so they're not just, you know, sitting there like an empty sponge waiting to be filled up. They have information in front of them, and I'll pose a question, and often it's something they can turn to their neighbors to talk about, or other times it'll be something they can just answer out loud right away, and other times we'll use clickers so that they'll have a chance to process more of an exam format question, see it in its you know, it's, it's typical exam format, talk to the neighbors about it and answer with a clicker. And so I think that the, the reason that I haven't really had classroom management issues with texting or web surfing and things like that is that the students are busy. <laughs> They're too busy, actually, in the moment and during that hour and 20 minutes to take the time to do those other things. I'm not saying that there's not possible there's a student sitting here texting off to the side, but it's not at all a distraction and it's not something that's come up where other students have said, oh, can you ask this person not to surf on the web while I'm in class? So I haven't come, those things just haven't been surfacing and it's not something I'm noticing. But I really do think it's because it's a very active classroom, it's a loud classroom. People are talking all the time and answering questions and shouting out answers or talking to their neighbors about a clicker question. And, and I think with all that activity in Hubbub, there just isn't that much time for them to choose to multitask in other ways. Um, so I think that's why that's not coming up, although I haven't actually asked the students to find out from their own opinions, but that's, that's my take on it. So my choice for presentation materials in the large class is I do choose to use PowerPoint. Um, my goal with the PowerPoint, though, is to make it mostly question-based. Um, and now it's a human anatomy class, so the content is visual. So it, you know, it, it begs visuals to, to come into play there. But I, what I try really hard to do is to consider that the text on the screen ideally shows up either as a question or after the students have answered the question so that they just have the visual clarification. So that's the goal behind the, the presentation materials is to, to bring the visuals on board, give students a chance by asking a question, for example, I might have some anatomy up there and have an arrow pointing to a piece of the anatomy and say, can someone tell me what this is called? I get an answer shouted out. What's the function of that? An answer is shouted out. You know, So it's that type of um, fluid back and forth between teacher and student dialogue and, and the reason that that can happen is that students came to the table with their own content already. Um, but the nice thing about it is then a student beside them can say, oh gosh, I thought that that was this. Now I better go look back at my external brain and make a little change. Or um, So that that's sort of the, the way I see the classroom dynamic working. Students have content, I'm prompting them to assess really together if their content's correct and if they understand the application, did they understand the function, and sometimes we'll bring in new content that they haven't had a chance to think about before, but that should be built on top of what they've already learned so that it's, it's a, a smooth you know, um, transition from content they brought with them to content that's being added in the moment. Um, so so that's, that's the basic technique that I use. And then embedded throughout the PowerPoint um, at various times are, are clicker questions. So the students have all purchased a clicker at the bookstore. They all have it with them each time, and they're registered to their name, so I know who's clicking when. Um, but uh, but the, the goal there is to give them a chance to truly take a step forward and say, this is what I think the answer is. Um, and that's been a really successful tool as well in this large classroom environment. Um, I, I don't actually care if they click the right answer or the wrong answer. I just want them to be checking with themselves, making a choice, you know, seeing, you know, would they be able to handle that exam question right now today with the knowledge they've built. Um, and so I let them discuss before. I'll put up a clicker question, then the room gets really loud, people talk to their neighbors, and then they select an answer. Um, and then it gives them a chance really to see, and me to see, you know, are we on the same page here? So I've really enjoyed that. You know, I'll just display the results up there right away. And if it's you know, 90% of the people are on the same page, then we usually spend very little time and move right on. Whereas if there's a lot of dichotomy in the answers, then we'll stop and say, okay, let's talk about someone who chose A, tell me why you chose A. You know, so the students have a chance to say, well, this is why I thought it was A, and this is why I thought it was C, and so we have a chance to really break it down. And I like it because it's an authentic exam style. I, I really don't think it's fair for students to have their first chance at, at seeing the format of how you're gonna ask them to access their knowledge on the day of the exam. I think it's a lot better if you can give them a chances along the way to be assessing their knowledge 
all the time. And so, you know, so if you if you take that then all as a as a big presentation style, I would say that, you know, there there is a PowerPoint going the whole hour and 20 minutes of class, but that's interrupted between visuals with questions with, you know, student responses with clicker questions um, and sometimes just group activities where I'll say, okay, you know, here here's a scenario, what would you do, what's the application, and, and let them talk for two or three minutes in their groups themselves. So all of those are kind of intermixed into, into a presentation style. I think one of the ways that a large classroom can feel not so large um, is when that little magic line between where the podium is and where the students are sitting, it, it evaporates. <laughs> and so I do like to move around the classroom. Um, I do that in a number of different times, either just while I'm speaking, if I'm asking a question, I might just start roaming around the classroom to ask. And the nice thing about that is that sometimes then someone who's less apt to just shout out their answer, when you're walking up and they're near now right beside them, they're more apt to just say their answer to you. And then you can say, oh, okay, I heard someone over here. This is what they had to say. And I can then make their voice loud for the rest of the group by sharing what they have to say. Um, the other opportunity that I have a chance to really roam around the classroom and get a little one-on-one -on -one conversations is when students are engaged in some sort of activity. So in anatomy, um, students bring their body to class, which is really helpful because they can move it, they can palpate it. Um, I'm actually amazed that all, not all anatomy classes include some degree of movement and palpating, but, um, but I figure, hey, they're bringing it to class, why not take advantage? And so we often will stop, especially in our full term um, musculoskeletal class, um, and, and the students will palpate a certain structure. So I'll say, for example, we'll be talking about the bones of the wrist, and so then we'll talk about how can you actually find which bones of the wrist you're, you're palpating. And so I can walk around the room and help them, I'll kind of give them some points like, hey, look for these, and I'll put an image up there of the bones themselves. And then myself and, and I have a few GTFs that are sometimes in the classroom with me, we'll walk around and start to answer questions and then students again, while they're, the classroom's very loud, they're all talking to each other and palpating and trying things, then I can walk around and someone can say, hey, can you come over here because I can't quite figure out if this is my PISA form or not, can you help me figure that out? Um, so it's, it just allows for a, a completely different dynamic than you would get if, if you never crossed the magic line in the front of the room. Um, I think it really feels very intimate and friendly and people feel very comfortable with that. Um, and then I think that the other opportunity that you have when you're walking around the room is if you've asked a question and you get an answer, but it's just sort of a starter answer that I, I my goal is to never answer my questions completely on my own. Um, and so, you know, I, there's a few different techniques to keep yourself from doing that. One is if you get no answer whatsoever, that you must assume that students do know. They're just either not sure what you really asked or not sure if they have the right answer. So let them talk to one another first. And then I, I almost, I can't say I've ever had a time where after turning the question back over to students in groups and saying, just talk to your neighbors. You, I know you'll figure it out together even though you haven't figured it out on your own. That they always come up with an answer. Um, that's I, I. It just it seems to work every time. So I'm I'm happy to keep using that technique until it fails. Um, but also sometimes someone will give an answer, but you know it's a beginner answer, and there's some more content behind that. Um, I think sometimes you can say to another student, hey, can someone follow up on that? You know, I agree with this, but does someone else have another idea or do you have some more to share? And so you can turn it back over to other students or ask them to explain. Sometimes I ask them just to explain in simple terms, like someone just tell me your gut feeling on what does this mean? And just use whatever language you want. And so they'll start there and I'll say, okay, so someone take that and now turn that into anatomical language. You know, how would we say that now if we we're writing the textbook? And, and just asking students to build on each other's answers, I think can help then to slowly build in the direction that you want them to go and get a more and more sophisticated answer once students have, the ones that maybe at first weren't sure what you're were asking have a chance to really feel confident about it. They kind of keep building on each other. When I first started teaching large classes, I think I did it the way I'd seen it done before and, and I had experienced myself and, and it tended to be, um, you know, students showed up saying, what are we talking about today? You know, on the syllabus it says the knee. Okay, we're going to talk about the knee today. And it was, it was quite didactic. You know, it had a lot of words on the screen, a lot of writing out of notes, um, and not a lot of really engaged faces. Um, I 
self-proclaimed a people person and therefore I'm looking at their faces and I wasn't very comfortable or fulfilled with the interaction that was going on. And so I started to try to think, well, what, what can I do to change? And you can't change the world overnight, but you can try to make little changes. And so, and the next year I said, okay, what's the first step to making this class look different than it's looked before? What's, what's one of my goals that I'm trying to meet? And so um, I think the very first one I did was to start asking questions versus always just having the answer up on the screen. I think that might have been the very first step that I took. Um, and But what I learned from that is that sometimes students would look at me like, how would I know the answer to that question? Aren't you going to tell me the answer to that question? You know, And so I realized, hey, you can only ask so many questions when students aren't bringing things to the table. And so I think then the next year, I decided, OK, now I need to incorporate more of the, you know, what kind of homework or what kind of preparation can students really bring so that they can answer the questions because they really have some meat and potatoes in front of them to deal with. So I think it was sort of a slow transition from a time in which it was, you know, again, much more of what I, I was used to seeing, which was just student expectation is to show up and take notes and my job is to tell. Um, we slowly moved over time to asking questions and then giving students the opportunity to be prepared for question asking and for interaction by building the assignments. And then I think over time we've just continued to move it a little bit further along in that now, you know, students began to tell me, you know, hey, uh, we feel like we understand in class, but then we get to the exam, we realize that it's a little different than the kinds of ways we were thinking about it. So then I started to embed the actual exam questions. Then clickers became available. So then I used, oh, clickers would be a good way to combine with the exam questions. So it's really been a slow process in the in the class. It it morphed in big jumps maybe in the first three years and then in much smaller ways over the next three years. Um, but now, six years later compared to the beginning, it does look very different. But um, I'm a firm believer of you can't change it all tomorrow because that's not realistic. So don't expect that of yourself. Instead, just set yourself one goal. It's one thing you want to change for the following year and then do that. And then make, set yourself one more goal and, and, and make that change. And, and I think that that allows for us to really to get where we want to get with our teaching, but in a way that's very reasonable and doable um, across the years.